This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. And a mile away from my house, they stopped me, handed me over a gun and asked me to kill my whole family and all those people. Uh, we, were, we were always waiting for being killed every day. I realized personally that the international community was not going to intervene. La vie était très dure, c'est vrai, parce que, bon, pour nous, on s'était séparé de nos familles. Mikolin is just built on what they call the plateau of Kigali in the city center, very close to all the embassies. Mikolin was a kind of business center for diplomats, for arms dealers, for all the people you can think of in the capital city of any African nation. It was the best hotel in the city. In the spring of 1994, the Hotel Mil Colin, which Paul Rusesabagina came to manage, became an island of refuge in a sea of fire. In just three months, nearly one million people were killed during the Rwandan genocide. The roots of the violence were decades old. Like many African nations, Rwanda has tribes with specific identities. Belgian colonial rule made clear an ethnic divide between the Tutsis, who were the minority, and the Hutus, who were the majority in Rwanda. The Belgians favored the Tutsis, stereotypically taller and slimmer, over the shorter and darker Hutus. Rwandans were required to carry identity cards indicating their ethnicity a practice that continued after independence in 1959. Rwanda's first president, Gregoire Kaibanda, an ethnic Hutu, led the Hutu emancipation movement to upend the Belgian-imposed power hierarchy. On the eve of independence in 1962, Hutu extremists killed tens of thousands of Tutsis forcing nearly 150,000 more to flee to neighboring countries, mainly Burundi, Uganda, Zaire, and Tanzania. In the Ugandan bush, exiled Rwandan Tutsis began to form a rebel army. Over four decades later, on the evening of April 6, 1994, a plane carrying Rwandan President Juvenal Habyarimana and Burundi President Cyprien Ntariamira was shot down over Kigali. The assassinations triggered what would become one of the bloodiest events in modern history. Rusesa Bagina remembers the day after the plane crash, when the world as he knew it began to unravel. Very early in the morning, my son Roger went out to see a son of a neighbor who was a good friend of him. And he, is, he was 14 years old. He was not that baby. So when he arrived at the place, he noticed that his friend, just next door, he noticed that his friend had just been slaughtered with his six sisters, the mother and two neighbors, and all of those nine dead bodies, were some of them still moving. So that boy came running, went to his room, and then went to hide. I went out to see what was going on. I noticed that many of my neighbors, all of these people we take as gentlemen, 
All of these people we take as bosses, CEOs of company, in companies, in ties, sitting behind in cars with the drivers. So I saw them in militia uniforms, in military uniforms. And I remember telling them, now listen, you guys, ah, it appears as if I'm the only person who did not know what was going on. Hutu militia, known as the Interahamwe, began rounding up and killing Tutsis, urging Hutus around Rwanda to do the same. As the violence spread from Kigali to the far corners of the country, over two dozen people sought shelter in Rusesabagina's home. On April 9th, 20 militiamen arrived at Paul's Gate demanding he unlock the food stores at the Diplomat Hotel, where Rusesa Bagina worked as a manager. The militia had taken over the hotel. Though Rusesa Bagina was Hutu, his wife Tatiana and those hiding in the house were all Tutsi. They ordered Rusesa Bagina's family and their 26 guests to travel with him to the Diplomat. And a mile away from my house, they stopped to me. He hadn't reached the hotel yet. After the carnage he had seen in his neighborhood, Rusesa Bagina feared the worst. Handed me over a gun and asked me to kill my whole family and all those people. I learned how actually to deal with the devil. At a given time, I opened my mouth, started negotiating, telling him that, listen, you, I do understand you. You guys are hungry. You guys are threatened, you guys are uh, tired. You guys are stressed by this war. But we can find a different solution, not kill these people. Myself, I do not know how to use guns. And I was very sincere, I did, never know, I did not know. But uh, then, that was not the solution. And they listened to me. They listened to me because we started negotiating. After two long hours, we came up with an agreement. And the agreement was to drive us to the hotel and me give the money. So this taught me one of the most important lessons of my life because from that day onwards, I kept on negotiating. Rusesa Bagina paid off the militia with money he recovered from the diplomat. Because they now occupied the hotel, he took his family and the others to the Mil Colline a nearby hotel owned by the same Belgian company, Sabena Hotels. Over 1,000 Rwandans had already sought refuge at the Mil Colline. Alexis Buningoma ran the restaurant at the hotel. Lui, il est venu comme le diplomate, il était directeur. Quand il est venu au Mil Colline, il n'y avait pas de directeur. Il s'est fait directeur de Mikoen. C'était la même chaîne des hôtels euh, belges. Quand il est venu, il s'est fait directeur et il a mis ses conditions. Trying to maintain some degree of normalcy, Rusesa Bagina asked his staff to print invoices and collect payments from those who were able to pay. He expected help would come soon from the international community. When we saw the 10 Belgian soldiers killed, and uh, that morning of April 7th, the Belgian government decided to pull out from the peacekeeping force, and uh, followed by the United States, the United Kingdom, backing them in the Security Council, deciding, making a decision to withdraw, to abandon a nation, we, it was so clear that no one was going to come back. The we realized, I realized personally, that the international community was not going to intervene. To keep the killers at bay, Rusesa Bagina bribed Interahamwe leaders with money and alcohol from the hotel bar. I remember some of them coming, whispering 
and saying, here do people speak? Do they talk? Where we were hiding, we could not talk. We were so silent. But in the Mikulim, life went on. Still, yeah. people lived in fear. The, the Pasa Mwenenganusie was another employee of the mill Colleen. Uh, we, were, we were always waiting for being killed every day, trying to survive by uh, the water, the, the food which was still in the store. People who ha had no room was staying uh, in the hall, in the corridors, and the rooms people were staying as uh, maybe 10 in a room, 5, 15 cooking from there, so you see, it was just a refugee camp. La vie était très dure, c'est vrai. Parce que, bon, pour nous, on s'était séparés de nos familles. Et des fois, il n'y avait pas de téléphone pour demander est-ce que, comment, c'est ce matin, est-ce que vous vivez encore ou pas. On May 2nd, nearly a month after refugees began to arrive at the Mill Colline, the United Nations sent Rusesa Bagina a list of refugees to be evacuated from the hotel. For some, help had finally come. Rusesa Bagina and his family were the first names on the list. That day, many Mikulin refugees came to me and told me that, listen, we know that you are living. And yet, so far you have been the only person who has been negotiating, talking to these people so that they don't kill us. Are you really living? But many of them insisted and told me that, listen, if you are living, please tell us so that we can go to the roof of the hotel and jump. Our main concern was not to die but how to die. Outside, killers were torturing their victims. What would he do? Save his Tutsi wife and her relatives by taking them to safety? Or risk his family to stay and try to help the thousand plus refugees? He chose a compromise. Paul decided to stay behind while his family was evacuated. I remember in the evening, around 5 p.m., escorting my wife and my children, taking them to the UN trucks, because we were taken by trucks. So I, without any hope to see them anymore, without any hope whether they were going to survive or not, there is nothing as heartbreaking as seeing your beloved ones and saying that maybe this is the right time, the last time I see these people. While he couldn't see a way out of Rwanda for himself, at least his wife would be okay with the United Nations trucks, no matter what would happen to him. Until the news came. The convoy had been ambushed by the militia. By the time my wife came back, she was completely down, lying down, laying down in uh, other people's blood mixed with hers, unable even to move. I picked her, I picked her up, took her to the room. She went and she stayed for many weeks unable even to turn into the bed. Outside, a battle raged between government forces and the Rwandan Patriotic Front, or RPF, a Tutsi militia born in exile in Uganda under the leadership of General Paul Kagame. We didn't know many things about what was happening outside. Uh, we were just seeing that on TV uh, from uh, Euro news and uh, other news from outside, uh, knowing that RPF have 
now the airport, but it was too far, the airport, uh, saying that they come there and save us. Uh, we're just thinking before they arrive, we will be killed. On June 18th, RPF leaders who were holding thousands of government prisoners hostage at a stadium across town proposed a refugee exchange with the Hutu power. It appeared that the ordeal at the Mill Colleen might finally end if the safety of the refugees could be guaranteed. After the attack on the previous convoy that carried Paul's wife, it still seemed risky, but they could not hold out in the hotel forever. A deal was struck, and a UN convoy evacuated all of the refugees at the Mill Colleen, 76 days after they first arrived. By mid-July, the primarily Tutsi RPF took control from the genocidal government, and three months of apocalyptic violence came to an end. In a small nation like Rwanda, which had seven million people, an average of 10,000 people were being killed every day. At the end of three months, between April 6 and July 4, 1994, between 800,000 and a million people were killed. 1,268 people helped by me, by my hotel, to survive meant, if you compare for the whole period of the genocide, if you compare with what, how many people were being killed every day, my hotel saved about four hours of life. Rusesa Bagina and his wife drove south from Kigali to his hometown. It was empty. Millions of Hutus, fearing acts of retribution, were fleeing to Tanzania, Uganda, and Burundi. So I started asking my brother some questions. Where are our neighbors? What is going on? And he looked at me, uh, he was telling me, this so-and-so has been killed by the militias, so-and-so killed by the army, so-and-so killed by the, um, the, the Tutsi rebels. And at a given time, I saw him very n nervous. And my own elder sister had been killed by the RPF. My younger brother had been killed by the Rwandan Patriotic Front. Many brothers-in-laws and many um, family members had been killed by this one or the other one. Paul recalls meeting one man on the run. And he told me that, listen, Paul, my dear brother, do me a favor. Leave this place for your own safety. Leave this place. It became clear to Rusesa Bagina that lives had been lost on both sides. What would he do? Leave his homeland and any chance of reconnecting with his family? Where would he go? Back to Kigali? Out of Rwanda altogether? I came back to Kigali very much disappointed, but still believed that we could make it, we could make a better country. He returned to work, reopening the Hotel Mil Colleen and Diplomat. But things never returned to normal. Two years later, in September of 1996, citing threats of violence and extortion, Rusesa Bagina left Rwanda with his family and fled to Belgium. In Brussels, his employer, Sabena Hotels, had no work to offer Rusesa Bagina. He began to work as a taxi driver. In 2001, Hollywood director Terry George heard about the miraculous story of the Mill Colleen. Um, I flew to Belgium and met Paul uh, in Brussels where he was a cab driver then and um, listened to his story and struck a deal with him and that became the genesis of Hotel Rwanda. 
Rusesa Bagina was hesitant. I was very bitter and angry against the international community as well. Those people who abandoned us, now the genocide is over. They want to do business after the genocide. He eventually agreed, and Hotel Rwanda was produced based on real-life events and released to critical acclaim. Ten years after the genocide, poor Rusesa Bagina became a widely celebrated hero. But many in Rwanda were shocked by Hollywood's account of what happened at the Mil Colin. When I saw it, lies. Fully. No, 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 no. C'est pas vrai. C'est pas vrai. We actually decided to carry out the research because lots of survivors of genocide were saying the film did not actually portray what happened uh, at the Hotel de Mille Collines. Dr. Alfred Ndahiro, a Rwandan academic and advisor to President Paul Kagame, conducted surveys and in-depth interviews, which culminated in a book disputing the accuracy of the film. So initially, he took in people who could afford to pay, pay for accommodation and pay for, for their food. Lui, il gérait l'hôtel comme c'était géré un hôtel dans le temps ordinaire. He was asking us to make invoices as if it was uh, uh, normal time. And if you don't have money, he asks you to leave the room and stay in the corridor or in any other place than in the room. It was not a fault of uh, the, the, the refugees to be there. They were not there as, uh, as if they were in holidays. People have said, if he did not save them, how come they survived? Uh, and there are a number of reasons, really. One of them being that the hotel was protected by the UN. So people decided to go there because they felt that was a safe place. Another reason, of course, uh, is that the people who were there had, uh, in a sense, become uh, not only hostages, but also exhibits. It was uh, like a sample to show to uh, foreigners uh, that uh, Tutsis are, or refugees are still alive. They are not, they, they are not being killed by the former government. Because Mil Colin was an, uh, a known hotel. The people, most of the people who were inside were, was uh, from the business community, from, uh, uh, it was uh, known people. And it was easy to say if that one is still alive, it means that there, there, are, there is no killings in Rwanda. After the film was released, Rusesa Bagina received a number of international human rights awards, giving him an important platform to talk about current affairs in Rwanda. With uh, President Bush and um, his wife, with me and my wife, these are the few ones I do have here. But if you go to Belgium, you will see another couple of them, because I do, as you know, I do have two homes. I do have, let me check. Rusa Sabagina began speaking out against Rwandan President Paul Kagame and his RPF party, alleging they were guilty of killing innocent Hutu civilians when they liberated the country in 1994. He also accuses the state of interfering in the affairs of Eastern Congo and suppressing freedom of speech. Today, Rwanda is more or less like a simmering volcano. As said Susan Rice, when she was in Rwanda in November 2011, in her speech, she said that if, this, if there is no political space in this country, if there is no freedom of speech, as long as human rights will be always abused, if, if you don't stop what she called night callers, because to threaten people, 
they are people, there are others who always call them in the night to threaten them. If this does not stop, all of this you have built will be destroyed and you will never see anything on this land. His position on the government has made it impossible for Rusesa Bagina to return to Rwanda. Today he moves between homes in Brussels and San Antonio, Texas, with his wife Tatiana. If I happen to go back, I know I'm one of the most wanted. I'm the actually number one on the, on, on the list of the most wanted Rwandans. And this is from the president's speech. Rusa Sabagina's role in the Milkolin and his portrayal in the movie have become a political football. Paul maintains his heroism as he criticizes the Kagame government. The government fights back by questioning his heroism. But like everyone else, I thought perhaps he was a hero. That's why I was very surprised when I heard from uh, lots of survivors who said, no, this is not true. Uh, Many blame Hollywood for engaging in myth-making. Hollywood production, for me, it's that. So, if I have to make a film, I have to make some things that make sure that the film is well sold. That's what I say. So, they have made a lot of things that were not true, maybe to make sure that the film is well sold, maybe to make sure that the film is well sold. It's a real production, Hollywoodian. Pas vraiment un documentaire, une vraie réalité, 100%. Il n'y a que peut-être 10% de réalité, de vrai. La seule chose peut-être, c'est qu'il était au milieu collines. Et qu'au milieu collines, des gens ont survécu. À ce moment-là, personne n'était intéressé à savoir qui a sauvé qui. Il a été un bon business juste... Uh, when he decided to, to make that movie, when, uh, had, uh, I don't know if he had uh, that uh, thinking before or uh, he met some movie makers after and uh, he said maybe there is an opportunity there. But uh, when you survive a genocide, you don't have time to say, oh, uh, I will say that it's me who helped the who to, to survive. You, you survived, that's all. You thank God. <laughs> Today, Rusa Sabagina runs the Hotel Rwanda Rusa Sabagina Foundation, an advocacy organization aiming to build sustainable peace in the Great Lakes region of Africa. He hopes to return to Rwanda someday soon. My dream is always to go back home to Rwanda. Rwanda is my home. Whenever I'm outside the country, I always feel in exile. I always feel as a refugee. Paul, like so many others, can't completely shake off the Rwandan genocide. Hutus and Tutsis still remain hostile. Separated by decades of conflict, current politics, and bad memories of three horrible months in 1994. 800,000 Rwandans wouldn't live to argue over who was a hero and who was a villain. More than six million Rwandans did survive, over a thousand laying low at the Mil Colleen. And to this day, most of those six million are just glad that they lived to see another day. Mm -hmm.